I'm going to talk about communicating risk and uncertainty. That's what I do. I'm, in fact, um, sponsored by a hedge fund, Winton Capital Management. That's my, um, who pay for my chair. But I don't do financial risk. We run a, we're an organization or a little group called Understanding Uncertainty. We did a lot of school stuff, talking about football results. Um, there's me on YouTube. I'm Professor Risk. Uh, here's me taking my clothes off. Two of me taking my clothes off. Um, we go into schools a lot, doing, talking to kids about working out the chances of events. Um, we also get involved increasingly in what are really exciting collaborations, doing randomized trials of different ways of presenting risk information to audiences. So this is BB, the big risk test on the BBC Lab UK website done in association with Bangos the Theory. It's the biggest experiment ever done on risk communication. We've had 100,000 participants on this do this. And uh, using a very complex randomized factorial design, people don't realize that um, they're only getting one of possibly 60 different ways of information. And uh, we're, we're assessing you know, how good that information is at communicating the risks. Another study, the Met Office are doing, have been doing a randomized trial of different ways of communicating uncertainty about weather forecasts. You know, showing, for example, looking at you know, how wide, how far an umbrella is open to represent the chance of any rain, for example. So this is one of the things we've been testing. Again, a randomized experiment. 10,000 people have done it online over a month. So th this is looking at evidence-based approaches of communication. Really exciting stuff. What I'm going to talk about today is the different ways in which we might communicate risk and uncertainty. Using words, using numbers, using graphics, my favorite. Alternative metaphors, the, the importance of, Ben's already mentioned, the importance of narratives and stories. How can we turn our things into stories that grip people's imaginations? And talk briefly about acknowledging uncertainty about the risks. Um, the reference, main reference for this is a recent review in Science, which has been published on visualization of uncertainty, um, and you can download this from our website. Okay, using words. Now, um, we're all in our everyday life say things might happen, they could happen, possibly happen. How good at these are communication? Well, there have been endless studies showing that these mean very different things to many people. You can try to improve consistency. Um, for example, the IPCC, when they're assessing the probability of findings in the climate change research, um, say they might use words like very likely, but they tend to calibrate it by saying this means between 90 and 100% probability. The various scales like this have been developed. And I think this is very useful. If you are going to use words, make sure that they at least have a consistent meaning. And you can tell people what the meaning is. Okay, let's say you wanted to tell somebody um, that the drug they were going to take had a 20% chance of a side effect, or it affected 20% of the population, or, or one in five chance. What would you tend to use in, if you were going to say that? You've got to think quickly. 20% chance, 20% probability, or one in five chance, 20 out of 100 people like you, none of the above. I wouldn't use numbers at all. It depends on the patient. Oh, interesting. Very interesting. So the probability not being used, very good. 20% chance, again, that's not very popular, not recommended. This tends to be the one recommended, is, is the most popular, 20 out of 100. This is very common. They're, they're, this is a bit dubious, as we'll describe. Wouldn't use numbers. Oh, you, people use numbers, cool. Depends on the patient. Again, very reputable response. People find that different levels of numeracy and understanding of the patient demand different forms of communication. Hey, this is cool. This is great. I haven't done this before. The problem is that not all the public is numerate. King's Cross Station has got a platform zero. They have to repeatedly announce platform zero is situated next to platform one, because otherwise people can't find platform zero. So, <laughs> This is important. That, so the language that is used is, is crucial. This is a, a standard question that's now been asked of many thousands of people. This is done um, in this particular paper in the Archives of Internal Medicine. We've now asked this of 100,000 people on BBC Lab UK. What represents the biggest chance of getting the disease? One in 100, one in 1,000, one in 10. Okay, I haven't actually asked you to vote on this one. This would be too embarrassing. Um, the, the correct answer is one in 10. The biggest number corresponds to the smallest risk. The interesting thing is how many people get this wrong in Germany and USA in a random set, set of the population on a telephone interview, a quarter of people get this wrong. Okay, the crucial thing is we're changing the denominator rather than the numerator. The, the uh, recommendation is you should keep the denominator fixed and change the numerator so the biggest number corresponds to the biggest risk. Also, because people only look at the numerator, they don't look at denominators. Okay, 
We all know about the issues of, of relative and absolute risk, how these are used to, um, to spin messages. And one of the classic things that has been referred to, which Gert Gigerenz and others refer to a lot, is mismatch framing, where the benefits of a treatment are expressed as a relative risk, a 59% reduction in cancers from, from screening, and the, uh, the harms of a treatment are expressed as an absolute risk, a one in a 10,000 chance of a perforation. Now, this is called mismatch framing. It's an absolute disgrace. Uh, it's very common, absolute disgrace. But things are changing. I'd like to, it's not all bad news. The, um, Association for the British Pharmaceutical Industry, new code of practice has banned this. You must not use relative risks on their own. Um, the, you, you can read all that if you want. The crucial thing is that you can refer to absolute risk in, in isolation. You must give absolute risks, not just relative risk for, for treatment. Very important innovation. So, for example, but of course, what about the prominence? Lipitor um, give a 36% benefit, so the benefits in terms of absolute risk, which is fine, th th in relative risk, the absolute risk is down here. It's actually a 3% to a 2% reduction. So that's only a uh, number needed to treat, 1% uh, of people, that means 100 people need to be treated for so many years in order to get benefit. So you can work that out. Slightly smaller font, but it does seem to obey the ABPI guidelines. So, what I'd like to really go back to is this idea of uniform reporting of benefits and harms. Now, this is a crucial message. Steve Willershen was speaking here last year on exactly this topic, a lovely video which I was watching. Um, the drug, they have developed this idea of the drug fax box, people at Gigerenza, where, the, where you list in the patient information leaflet, not just for the doctors, the people taking the placebo and the drug, both the benefits and the harms in terms of both percentages and absolute risks. I'm not going to get into the argument about are percentages better than three, is it 30% or 30 out of 100? It's going on and on and on. It's, people, um, really a lot of evidence either way about which is better. Um, so I'm not, I, they, they're using both here, both the frequency and percentage. But the crucial thing is, is uniform reporting. Um, now, the, the, the amazing thing is that the, uh, in the US, this idea looks like it might become mandatory. Uh, the FDA Risk Communication Advisory Committee says that the FDA should use it in drug information leaflets. The, um, the Obama Health Care Act mandates that they, the FDA need to evaluate it. Amazing, Lotion Schwartz managed to get this into the Obama Health Care Act, that the drug facts box should at least be evaluated. The, the, but of course, it can be very uncomfortable. This is one that Gert Gigerenzer has got on his website about prostate cancer early detection, a drug fax box, how many people with and without screening, how many men uh, die from prostate cancer, die from any cause. Not a lot of difference there between the treatments, and when you look at the harms, it's all on the screening arm. So, you know, information presented as transparently as this can be deeply threatening. And, of course, um, we've just seen the, all the recent discussion about breast cancer screening as well. Okay, so those are numbers. The next part of my talk, I'd like to talk about putting these things into pictures. I love pictures. You know, I think pictures are so important. Um, I'd like to just show a story, which I think is a fantastic use of graphics. And this was a story uh, last month in the BBC. It was um, pushed by a charity beating bowel cancer, three-fold variation UK bowel cancer death rates. Ho shock, horror. A, a blogger, uh, a, a, not a professional at all, a blogger took that data, lifted it off the website, and produced this funnel plot. Now, this shows the rates of bowel cancer detection against the population using the data from that study. These are the chance lines. The data form a complete funnel. It's all chance. The only point that isn't really chance is that one, and that must be a data error. I do not believe that is a true data point. There's no story there whatsoever. Demolished by a simple graphic using publicly available data, but it was difficult to, for him to get it out. Done by a blogger. I think this is fantastic proof of the value of open data. Really tremendous. So graphics are important. You know, that's the end of, end of story. End of story apart from the obvious mistake in Glasgow. Um, there are all sorts of graphics for showing probabilities. This is one I, I quite like this one. Um, this is a, a pie chart, standard pie chart. This is for showing probabilities of um, uh, results of a football match. This was Stoke versus Arsenal um, in last May. In fact, uh, Stoke, uh, no, 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 what was the score? Yeah, Stoke won. Stoke beat Arsenal, which was very surprising. 
Um, apparently Stoke have got a very strong home advantage because their pitch is a strange shape. It's only about that wide or something. So anyway, this shows the segment broken up into uh, showing probabilities. This is not a good pie chart. Uh, this shows um, you know, presidential preferences. This is from Fox News. Um, values in a pie should add up to 100%. So they're not all great. So you've got pie charts, bar charts, very popular. Um, uh, this is one used by Adjuvant Online, a, a website to, um, to for help clinicians communicate to their patients the benefits of, of yeah. chemotherapy. Um, th what's interesting about this is that they're using the whole 100%. It allows you to do what's called a part-to-whole comparison. They're not just showing the bit of benefit. These are the only women, five out of 100, they say will benefit because of the chemotherapy. The ones who are alive because of therapy. That red bar with the therapy has been turned into that. So only five out of 100, number needed to treat what, a tw 20 in this case, very clear, quite clearly communicated. Um, again, experiments have shown, though, that this information perhaps could be more com clearly communicated using icon arrays, showing 100 people what will happen to them. This is an icon array for me. Um, this is from uh, 23andMe. This is a result of me <laughs> spitting into a tube and sending off my, uh, my stuff to the US to do heaven knows what to. But anyway, when they come back, they tell me that I've got a 31.3% chance of getting diabetes between 20 and 79 based on my genetic information alone, the, the markers they look at. Um, interesting that they use... Elsewhere, they do use a relative risk, but I quite, li I quite like this. Icons, 31 out of 100, compared with the average, 26 out of 100. Um, you can block them, you can scatter them. There's been experiments on doing that as well. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question in a minute, but just to show. So for me, for example, I've got about a 10% chance of a heart attack or stroke in the next 10 years. Um, if I take statins, I reduce by about 30%. So that's what I've been told. Um, how can we represent that? Uh, well, again, when these sort of smiley plots that have been quite popularized, this is one that we can produce on our software very easily, showing 100 people like me, and 10 of them are going to have a heart attack or stroke in 10 years. If they don't take the statins, and those three will have it prevented. Well, lucky old them. You know, we can immediately see that there's a number needed to treat us about 30 out of 100 people, only three are going to, like me, only three are going to benefit from taking these, taking these statins. Okay, so quick question. If you had to communicate that kind of information about statin risk or anything like that using graphics, what, would, what do you like? Pie charts, bar charts, icon arrays, none of the above. Wouldn't use graphics, depends on patients. Which ones do you like? Pies, bars, or icons? Assuming they're well designed and quite nice to look at. And uh, the answer is, what do we find? Yeah, icon arrays, interesting, depends on the patient. Pie is not very popular. Again, this is, this is really nice, lovely information. God, this is so great. God, I love doing this. I could do this all day. Um, this is really good. Oh, yeah, uh, icon arrays. Um, on the randomized trials, icon arrays come out better than bar charts on the whole. Um, so that, that's, this, is, this is very nice. This is very good in, in information I'm getting from you, indeed. We can get onto narratives and metaphors. People say, oh, people don't understand uncertainty. Hang on. It's being used all the time. And there's a wonderful image that was used recently for Hurricane Irene. Um, in the mainstream US media, they just put up the different projections from different computer models. They just put them up and said possible paths. Fantastic representation of uncertainty about what might happen, giving a broad idea, showing the variability, using the metaphor of possible futures, the ways things might turn out, out of eight ways things might turn out. Really powerful, immediately into practice. Great, spaghetti plots, they're known as. Lovely. So when we look, we, the metaphor and the story is really important to grasp people's imagination. So one of the ones I particularly like is this idea of possible futures. Rather than saying, oh, what would happen to 100 people like me, say, 100 ways things might turn out for me. All these possible futures, all these little spaghetti things are going into the future. Well, how many of them are going to end up with me with a heart attack or stroke, and how many not? So here, here I am. Here's 100 possible futures for me over the next 10 years, and uh, in 90 of them, I'm just fine. Um, if I take my statins, in three of them, I've had my heart attack or stroke prevented, and in seven of them, I've got my heart attack or stroke, not necessarily dead. Um, of course, if I, don't have a, if I take my statins and don't have a heart attack or stroke, I'll no idea whether it's a green one or a yellow one, in other words, whether it would have happened anyway. The scattering increase has been shown to increase the um, perception of unpredictability but, of course, it makes them more difficult to count and compare. Um, our software allows you to have them scattered or, or blocked up. Now, 
my stroke, the thing I've been really interested in, I was introduced to these by Gert Gigerenza, is this lovely work by Otto Neurath and Gert Ernst. Pre-Second World War, part of the, uh, he was a logical positivist philosopher, part of the Vienna School, and he was a, a, a Marxist who was um, very concerned with communicating to the masses the means of production and uh, in a clear and transparent way. And they invented this idea of isotype, which are the blocked icon arrays. You can think of the sort of, no, sort of icon, um, uh, you know, bar charts made out of icon, icons. So this showed car production in the rest of the world and in the USA. This shows out of 100 women, or you know, these, each of these represents 5% of women in different countries, how many were employed in 1930, and in what industries. So um, we've been developing these, which I want to show you now, in various contexts. But before I do that, let's do a standard, and my final question I want to ask um, is about mammography. The Cancer Research UK website says that mammography has a sensitivity of around 85%, a specificity of around 90%. If a woman has a positive mammogram, not her first, what's the probability she actually has breast cancer? According to the Cancer Research UK website, I'm going to do this very quickly. Quick, one, two, three, four, five. Don't want to give you time to calculate it. What's the answer? And the answer is, that's it. That's your time's up. And the answer is, oh, very good. A good range, good range, good range. The answer is 8%, which is the most likely result that people have got. But a big, a big range of opinion there. I didn't give you time to think about it very well. The point is that only 8% of people with a positive mammogram actually have breast cancer. And according to the recent analysis that came out yesterday in the Annals of Internal Me in, in Medicine uh, by Welsh and others, um, of women who have breast cancer detected at screening and survive 20 years, 90% of them would be alive had they not gone to screening. So when people say they've been set, have their lives saved because of screening, actually only one in 10 have had their lives saved because of screening. Incredibly powerful analysis. Needs to be looked at more carefully, I think, but um, a very powerful argument indeed. Okay, so how can we communicate this rather tricky idea that almost everybody who has a positive mammogram does not have cancer? Now these are using the images that Gigerens have suggested for ages. We've computerized this lot on our website to make a website, make an animation. But you can just think of a thousand women. Um, ten, you know, on average, ten would have breast cancer. Nine hundred ninety would not have breast cancer. It's ninety percent sensitive. It'll find nine of those. But actually, of these, of the ones who don't have breast cancer, um, one in ten will be falsely diagnosed as a positive, as positive breast cancer as having breast cancer. That means that out of 108 people who are, have a positive test, only nine have, have breast cancer. So only 8% do have breast cancer. So that's the way to think. The fact that there's so many people who don't have breast cancer that even a small percentage false positive rate will mean that most of your results are, are false positives. So we can also display that out of what happens to 1,000 people. Here's 1,000 people. These are all the ones that test negative. Those are all the ones that, um, uh, sorry, those are all the ones without breast cancer. These are the ones that test positive. Most of them don't have, most, most of them don't have breast cancer. Now, using this, this idea of these icon arrays, the, the, the real idea of, of NURAT, um, we can look at other sorts of data. Let's say me taking my statins. So, okay, what's the benefits and harms of statins? If I go to the recent paper in the BMJ based on the Curious database, this is what it says. It says that of 1,000 people like me, moderate risk of heart attack, having taken statins, this is what will happen to them in, in five years. If without statins, there'll be that many heart attacks or strokes, et cetera, et cetera, cataracts, liver, and with statins, there'll be that many. Now, that's quite difficult to, get, to look at in your head. So if I, if I take the differences between them, it much more sh clearly shows the risk balance. So the benefits of taking the statins is that there are this many heart attacks or strokes and esophageal cancers prevented at this cost of side effects, according to that paper. Woo, what's the balance there? Well, it might depend on the patient, what their preferences are, etc. So but the point is that you're putting an absolutely explicit balance of risks up there. Um, of course, the other thing is, this is slightly more naughty, what do you do with the fact that you've medicalized 1,000 people? They're all having to take these tablets every day. Which side do those go on? Do they go on the, the harm side or not? So, um, you know, one has to think about perhaps bring that into it as well. 
Okay, so what I'd like just like to finish off with then is a video of some work we're doing in taking the Cochrane Collaboration Summary of Findings table and applying these ideas to that representation. It's two minutes, it's got no sound deliberately, um, but it should, the idea is that it should be self-explanatory. So I might say a few things, but otherwise I might just leave you to read it. Not quite sure about the timings, how long to let these stay up. Yeah, this is like the star rating on the, um, on the evidence, three, three, three out of four stars. Sorry, this is for adjuvant radiotherapy after surgery for cervical cancer. <coughs> So that's the big step, to go for the differences, to, to subtract the smaller from the larger on each side and highlight the differences, because that creates the risk balance now. Now this is normally what I would explain going through static slides, but we're trying to do this so anyone can see it. That could be the end of the story. This is the, this is the advance for the advanced user. We put the uncertainty around these estimates, which is, comes out of the Cochrane review. We blur them. Absolutely got very little idea about the death data. I think could be essentially ignored. Yeah. And that's it, so thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Stephen Martin. I'm a chemical pathologist and was part of our accreditation with the National Accreditation Body, Clinical Pathology Accreditation UK. They're asking us to convey the risk of uncertainty in measurements to the users of blood tests. This is, an, as you've shown, this is an incredibly difficult thing to portray. People expect a blood test to give a true result, yeah, 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 exactly. but of course it doesn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have any advice you could give us to oh, help? Um, uh, graphically, um, I quite like things that actually explicitly show distribution around the value you've got to show the level of uncertainty, which you can represent a distribution or blurring using color which again is used, for example, by the Bank of England to communicate uncertainty about future inflation rates, showing blurring around a, around a projection. I don't like estimate and confidence in, in intervals. I mean, they're, they're, uh, an estimate and a 95% interval I think is a grossly misleading. Uh, it com hugely communicates the idea that the value could be anywhere between the top and the bottom. Um, it doesn't give an idea that actually it's most likely to be very close to the center rather than that. Those are the real extremes. So I would say that an interval is a very misleading measure and something that shows um, you know, actually that you're pretty sure it's fairly close to the value you've quoted is much better. Great presentation, thank you. Uh, I'm from Chicago in the US, so my question has to do with uh, the drug industry. Uh, the the uh, drug representatives that come to practices in the United States and, and the drug advertising uh, methods seem to be masters at distorting statistics. I call them the bamboozle charts, where they, you know, they pick a, a relative risk of one minor outcome and blow it up yeah, yeah, poster yeah, size. Yeah, yeah. So uh, my question is, you, you, you mentioned that the FDA is considering some sort of regulation regarding how data is displayed. Do you know if there's any uh, efforts or thoughts about extending that kind of expectation regarding uh, drug advertising or marketing? Oh, I especially, I mean, and advertising direct to patients, of course, which you can do in New Zealand and the US, is, is, um, opens up all sorts of things. Um, I'm not sure, again, the ABPI, you know, have put into their code of conduct, conduct that 
you know, this is not supposed to be done. You know, just quoting relative risks is, ag is against their professional code of conduct in their adverts. So, um, you know, it is, there is notice being taken of that. Uh, I don't know what the controls on advertising in the US are. As I said, the Lipitor, is, that's a US advert, at least they do give the absolute risk. You can look kind of, put your glasses on, but you can see it. <laughs> but they don't give the numbers needed to treat. And um, in the UK, GPs have the Quality and Outcomes Framework, which um, exhorts us to pre pre prescribe statins, perhaps not to yourself with a risk of only 10%, but at 20%, we are supposed to yes, be prescribing yeah. statins and yep. blood pressure tablets and so forth. And um, our public health colleagues and the PCTs are now producing tables showing how well we're performing against the various criteria and whether we're identifying all the, the necessary patients and um, beating us about the head because we're not identifying enough patients and we're not prescribing enough. I wonder, Pache, Ben, um, whether there's any way of persuading our public health colleagues to look at the data with a little bit more sympathy to look at um, risks and benefits yep. and yep. spreads. Oh, I, I think you've identified a crucial issue, which is this essentially argument between you know, the, 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 the the clinician and the public health expert. Because when you think of things from a population point of view, all sorts of interventions make a lot of sense. We can save so many thousand heart attacks, breast cancers, etc., per year. And from a public health perspective, that's quite correct. But from an individual perspective, it might be completely rational not to accept that intervention. And they can both be right. And, and it's the whole problem of, you know, that Jeffrey Rose, you know, identified so long ago, the prevention paradox that, you know, to get the biggest public health benefits, people of moderate risk, who actually won't notice any benefit to themselves at all, need to be, need to take advantage, you know, need, need to have the intervention on them. And it's just, that's the way it is, that, there is, that the both perspectives can be rational from their own perspectives, the population perspective and the individual perspective. So it can be completely reasonable for someone to recommend I have a treatment. It can be completely reasonable for me to say I don't want it. Nobody's right or wrong. So I think each view has to be treated with respect. I don't think there's any simple answer to this at all. I'd love to know if somebody had an answer. And to improve these kinds of evidence-based decisions, uh, have you given any thought to how you might implement some of the findings of your work around communicating uncertainty in sort of day-to-day -day clinical practice in GP well, settings? We're, we're, we're working with the JBS on the JBS3 guidelines, which are going to be um, for the cardiovascular risk, which will be implemented using all these ideas of the risk balance and the icon arrays and various different ways of representing. I'm working with the um, abdominal uh, aortic, um, aortic, aortic AAA screening program on their risk communication things which are using all these ideas. So we, essentially we're just working with different organizations to implement uh, these ideas, yeah. Um, because the implementation, the interesting thing is, um, you know, you've got uh, paper-based things and you've got posters, you've got information. But I think, again, what I've showed about the film is that there's, and uh, we've got all the stuff in interactive animations as well, so people can explore it and choose the representation that makes more sense to them. We have to go beyond just simple patient information leaflets and think about um, way, things that adapt to the patient demand that people can, can log on and look at on the web and can talk about it with their families and, every, and they can get their kids to explain things to them and, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. We've got to look at multiple representations for different audiences. I always find it amazing that the pa people are quite prepared to have patient information leaflets in you know, all different languages and even for different levels of literacy. They don't have different versions for different levels of numeracy, which actually splits the population far more than many of these other things. That, um, and so we need multiple versions for multiple audiences.